The Short North is a gathering place unique among Columbus's distinctive neighborhoods. It's long welcomed all kinds of people at all sorts of gatherings. And what may be the feature most closely associated with Columbus goes back to a gathering that took place here long before it was called the Short North. In 1888, Columbus hosted a huge reunion of Civil War veterans who had served in the Grand Army of the Republic. When the GAR came to Columbus in 1888, they arrived around 200,000 strong to a city of only about 80,000 people. That would be the equivalent today of having about 3 million people show up in central Ohio and decide to stay for a couple of weeks or so. All those people flooded into the neighborhood. What we call the Short North now was then just a causeway between downtown and the new university to the north. It was also the location of the train station. To deal with that large number of people coming to town, a series of temporary wooden arches lit by gaslight were erected along the high street corridor from the train station at Nationwide Boulevard all the way down to the courthouse at Mound Street. People liked the arches a lot. The arches lit up the night and flushed out the pickpockets. When the streetcars were electrified, the arches supported the wires. And the arches gave the city an identity and a new nickname, the Arch City. Today, the arches burn brightly and give Columbus its identifying feature. Early in its history, the Short North had other identifying features too. One is long gone, but the other we enjoy every day. Lincoln Goodale came to Columbus in 1805, and he wore a lot of hats. Shopkeeper, pharmacist, and physician. He also made enough money to become the city's first millionaire. In 1851, he decided to basically thank the people of Columbus and Central Ohio, so he gave Columbus its first park. Before that, the only thing that American cities had were town squares and greens. In 1851, three parks were commissioned. Goodale Park at 33.4 acres, Lafayette Park in St. Louis at 30 acres, and about a 30-acre area around the Smithsonian Institution. Those three parks formed the beginning of what I consider the modern park, and they were open free to everyone. Everyone could come and walk for exercise, they could promenade in their carriage, they could bring their children for swings, they could paddle a boat around a small lake, and they could skate on winter ice. Life wouldn't be the same without fresh cut grass in the early evening. Goodale was not a foolish man. He owned the land surrounding the park as well, and so it clearly was a motivation on his part. He saw that as an attribute that would help market the lands and the development surrounding it. He wanted to create an exclusive suburb, so to attract more buyers, he lobbied successfully to move Capital University to the corner of Goodale and High. Still, it was the park that drew the most attention. Running through the autumn leaves, the barking dogs and barbecues, they call me homeward. But Columbus nearly lost the park during the Civil War. When President Lincoln called for volunteers in 1861, Ohio was completely unprepared for the thousands of volunteers. The park became a hastily converted campground for the soldiers. They had thousands more than the park could hold, and they ended up with 7,000 people. Three weeks after the park was invaded by the military, Lincoln Goodale wrote a letter to Columbus City Council saying that the occupation of the park was a total perversion of his gift. If Goodale found the city didn't use the land to his specifications, the land would be returned to him. Two weeks later, it was announced that Camp Chase, a new facility to the west, would be erected to accommodate the soldiers in Goodale Park. 